So you already know quite a lot about Jesus and who he is, but what do you really know about Michael the Archangel? How can we tell to what extent, if any, Jesus and Michael compare in the Bible? Well, here's a little pretest, and you don't have to write your answers down or anything, but honestly see if you already know which one's which. Off the top of your head, which one is our heavenly prince, and which one is the leader of heaven's armies? Which is the one that's supposed to defeat Satan? Who's the one that's supposed to stand up in a time of unprecedented distress, uh, whose return will call those asleep in the dust of the ground to awaken back to life, i.e. resurrect the dead? Which one is called like God? And who is God's chief messenger? And let's just arbitrarily go with the NASB translation this time. First, we have to clear out the elephant in the room. Trinitarians tend to immediately object to Jesus being any sort of angel and shut down. So let's go with a nice familiar verse, John 1.1, 1, 1, and stick with the least controversial third of it. En arche in hologos. In the beginning was the word. Are we all comfortable with the word referring to Jesus? He doesn't have to switch back and forth where Jesus has to cease to exist to become the Word, but rather the Word, the Son of Man, the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Zion, the Prince of Peace, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords are all just names and titles for the same being. But we include the Word as one of these names. Zechariah is an amazingly specific text of Messianic prophecy, so who's actually delivering this message of Jehovah? Well, in the very first verse in the book, the one that came to deliver the message was the Word of Jehovah, Hayad Devar Yehovah. I'll quote from Chabad.org because the presentation in most interlinears is kind of dizzying. Hebrew is a difficult enough language and being written right to left makes the side-by-side -side comparison a lot easier. Plus, it's considered a very reliable source in the Jewish community. And just look at all those vowel points. Seeing the full Shavach Olam Kametz just kind of makes me happy. Anyways, in Zechariah, the words first visit only lasts a few verses, but then he comes back in verse 7, again with the title of The Word, which many mainstream Trinitarians are comfortable with saying that this is a pre-incarnate Jesus, the same word as in John 1.1, 1, 1. even though throughout the rest of Zechariah's writings, it goes back and forth interchangeably between Devar Yehovah and Malek Yehovah, the word of Jehovah or the angel of Jehovah. So with this context in mind, if we're comfortable calling the Word an angel and Jesus is the Word, then it's okay for Jesus to be a messenger of God, an angel. Anyways, let's get back to John 1.1 and get through a little bit of grammar. Articles are very important in Greek, and English is very easy with only one word, the, which can be used just about anywhere. Plus, we have choices for specifically indefinite articles, such as the word a, specifically indicating it's not the ball, just a ball. Other languages are a lot more complicated, such as German with der, die, das, den, dem, etc. Uh, depending on the case and the gender of the word it's attached to. Greek is closer to German in that way, and sometimes you need a chart to decide which definite article to use. You can't just use the all the time. So in the case of hologos in proston theon, ton, is the singular masculine accusative definite article, so it must be attached to a noun that matches that case, gender, and number, which Theon does, so we're all good. That's definitely accusative, the object of the sentence. And then we get to the clause everyone fights over, que theos in hologos, and there's plenty of lengthy explanations about this all over the internet. People go back and forth, there's experts on each side, but the Cliff Notes version is that theos here is acting as a nominative predicate. It's qualitatively describing the subject of the sentence. So to give you an English comparison, I could say, I am holding a mouse, and I am as quiet as a mouse. In this case, I'm clearly not the mouse that I'm holding. I'm holding a literal mouse, but I'm also qualitatively expressing mouse-like qualities. I'm quiet as a mouse, a nominative predicate. So the translation in the NWT of the word was a god is not to imply that Christ is a second deity or a sub-deity, but it is the most direct translation the NWT translators could think of to communicate the idea that the word expressed the qualities of the god with whom he was, i.e. the word was godlike. He was like the god with which he was. He was qualitatively Theos, godlike. And we can finally make our first point. The name Michael means who is like God, which is how John 1 1 describes the word. Now, it's true a lot of names mean things that aren't literally true. For example, the name Samuel. 
It's based on the Hebrew name Shemuel, which means the name of God, even though the name of God is not actually Samuel. But we do find it interesting that the name Michael describes the description of the word as qualitatively theos, or godlike, who is like God. But this could just be a coincidence. So let's take a look at the next term, Archangel. The most specific text I've seen to describe the station befitting of the name Archangel is in Hebrews 1, 1 through 9. Here God speaks of his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Verse 4 shows his son becoming much better than the angels, which would be impossible if his son was co-eternally co-equal with the father and already better than the angels. For him to become better than the angels, they would have had to start out as his peers before he was made better than them, which is specified in verse 9, where God anointed Jesus with the oil of gladness above his companions. The word here is metohus, which means peers, fellows, or companions. It specifies that Jesus was anointed over his angelic peers, a rather keen description of the term archangel. And then back to the idea of Jesus being described as an angel before being anointed archangel, note verse 5, which asks, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Now I constantly hear my Trinitarian friends suggesting that this is clearly rhetorical, and that means the answer is none. But as much as the context seemed to suggest the answer is Jesus, not none, it's undeniably clarified in chapter 5, verse 5, where the question is repeated, specifically applying to Jesus. And again, I'm not going to spend too much time here because I have a lot of points to make, so I'd encourage you to pause at this point to read through the context, because a lot of people don't truly appreciate how absolutely beautiful chapter 5 is. I need to do another video sometime, because I know that there's details that I've just overlooked my whole life just reading the English on the page, but the historical significance of what's really being said is actually just really beautiful, and what's really meant by him having been made perfect, and the difference between Aaron and Melchizedek, but that tangent would take too long here. And I'm not forgetting about chapter 1 verse 8, I'm just trying not to get too far from the topic of Jesus and Michael here. I suppose the overlap between their names and titles could just be a coincidence, so let's compare their actions. Let's read through Revelation 12, 7 through 11. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. But wait. Most people suggest that Jesus is the seed of the woman who will be bruised in the heel and who will bruise Satan in the head. Why did Michael battle and defeat Satan, bringing salvation? Why did Michael seem to be the one called God's Christ? That's supposed to be Jesus. And the adversary being overcome because of the blood of the lamb after a battle with Michael. I suppose the scripture could have just moved on to something completely different, but it sure would make a lot more contextual sense if Jesus were in verse 7 rather than Michael, especially given in chapter 19 describing the word seeming to lead heaven's armies in the battle of Armageddon. Maybe two commanders in heaven's armies, I guess? Kind of a stretch though. But there is one particular event that seems absolutely unique in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Here it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will raise first. Here we have Jesus returning with a shout, with the voice of the archangel to raise the dead. Now some focus solely on Jesus having the voice of the archangel, which is indeed interesting, and I suppose this could just be yet another coincidence, but I'm more interested in the unique role of the dead rising at the sound of the voice of the archangel. See, because John 5 specifies that it's the voice of the Son of God that the dead will hear and raise, specifically a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. So maybe it's really Jesus' voice, and he was just being compared to the archangel. Jesus comes with his own voice, sounding like an archangel. So that answers that question, until you go back to Daniel 12, where it's very specifically Michael who will stand for us during the time of great distress, our great tribulation, later shown to be the Battle of Armageddon, where he makes good on his promise and battles for us. 
and in response to his return, the dead will rise, in exactly the same way John 5 describes as happening for Jesus. And that's just too hard to call a coincidence. Even after all that, does it really count as a central doctrine for Jehovah's Witnesses? Not really. I like how it's phrased in the What Does the Bible Really Teach book, where it words it very cautiously, saying, it is logical to conclude that Michael is none other than Jesus Christ in his heavenly role. The Bible never directly says Michael the Archangel is Jesus, and so we can't definitively say he absolutely must be. But they're both God's chief messenger, above all other angels, the heavenly prince, the commander of heaven's armies, that stand up for us, defeating Satan and raising the dead. It's logical to conclude that they're the same individual. Now is it enough to pray in the name of Michael? Absolutely not. But this is why we find it quite reasonable to believe that it's more than just a correlation.